can all resonate with the obstacles and adversities that life throws our way. Things unexpected, unanticipated, and often hurtful or shameful or unkind. But what causes some to decide that this life is too difficult to live? What kinds of things in our life path might cause some to consider ending their life? In this series, Stories of Adulthood and Aging, the decision to engage in a suicide attempt and live to talk about it is explored through an interview with Daniel Wood in Surviving Obstacles, I Am a Suicide Survivor. Well, my name is Danielle Wood. Uh, I was born in Florida, but my family only lived there six months. So, I mean, then we, they moved back to Ohio. So basically, I'm from Ohio. My family is highly dysfunctional. For the first seven years of my life, me and my two brothers lived with our dad, and that was just kind of crazy. Uh, it was a lot of parties, a lot of adults, and you know, so we were just kind of running around. Then we went to go live with our mom and our stepdad, and we had a new baby brother. Honestly, there wasn't much modeling. My stepdad was an alcoholic. It modeled things not to do. I took some, some of it from that, how I didn't want to be. We cannot discount the influence of early childhood experiences on our adult development. Children watch, learn, and model their behaviors after those with whom they come in contact. This includes early developments of our faith perspectives and our religious practices. I do remember going to church with my grandparents. I don't remember anything except for going in <laughs> and walking in. And I remember that at Easter time, in our Easter baskets, there was a cross. It was plastic, and it had a little black platform. And I don't know if I really knew, but I knew it was something important. And I remember praying. And I guess maybe I got that from my grandparents, too. Then we go to live with our mom and stepdad, and um, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. So we kind of went from all this running around, doing whatever we want, to, and he was super strict, too. So all this structure, no holidays, no birthdays, um, church three times a week. I had had the view of religion as they're standing up here and telling you everything bad about yourself. You know, the leaders, the pastor, whatever is higher up. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe in hell. I used that for a while, especially my, in my 20s. So I could just make any decisions I want and there was no consequence. When 9-11 happened, just seeing it on TV, it was traumatic, and the scenes of the buildings and the people running and fire. Well, by this time, I'm uh, 20, and I called my pappy, my mom's dad, and I was like, I don't know, I'm scared, is the world gonna end, you know? And he asked me if, you know, I'd ever had Jesus in my heart, and I, I said no. So he said, you gotta come up here. So I went up a couple days later and he read some scripture to me and he uh, explained to me about Jesus and all you have to do is ask. And, and he, it was really upsetting because he, he said, I, must, I thought I taught my kids well enough that they would pass this on. He said, I feel like I failed as a grandfather. So he showed me that and we prayed a prayer together and I felt better, but I didn't change anything in my life because also at this time I'm, um, I'm using and drinking a lot, using drugs and drinking a lot. Um, and that's why I had the whole, there's no hell thing, so I can do what I want. Um, and I wasn't aware yet that I was, I have the disease of addiction. The good news in our adult development is that humans have the capacity to thrive and to survive. Even in the midst of our most devastating experiences, some of the most beautiful healing and hope can occur. Well, my mom kicked me out when I was 15. And honestly, through all the um, abuse, especially the um, like verbal and mental, you know, of my mom saying, you're not gonna be any good and things like that, it kind of just gave me motivation. So I didn't want to, you know, 
become what she was trying to say. Around my senior year, I started um, partying, experimenting with drugs and alcohol. At this time in my life, I really had the mentality of, um, you can't count on anybody, so you have to do it yourself. I had thought about suicide since I was young. My first suicide attempt, I still lived at home when I was 11. And that was always my go-to. Well, if this happens, if this doesn't happen, I'll just kill myself. Because I um, took a bunch of my stepdad's insulin. But yeah, I didn't. It, obviously, it didn't work. And nobody knew either. It was getting to a point where I couldn't keep a job um, because getting and using drugs and alcohol was taking all my time. It's a whole another kind of lifestyle. And it just kept, I just kept going down that road. I lost um, my house. I had a fiance, he left. Um, all I had left basically was a car that he had bought me. And so I was living in my car for a while. It was 2003, the next five years I was on and off the streets. Drugs and guns and gangs and you know all this kind of stuff. That's the life I had to live to be able to get the drugs so I didn't have to feel. I end up you know, losing my apartment, my job, everything. I go shack up with some guy and I started, you know, then all these things are coming back, you know, because now I have to think about my life and oh, look what happened and look what, what happened now and where I'm living and I hate this place and everything. And so suicide started coming in my head again. You know, that was always my go-to before and I would drive around and I'd be using and drinking and driving and you know, I found this bridge that was high and, and it was on a highway that I drove a lot. So, I mean, I purposely went out looking for somewhere. It was um, August 16, 2009, and it was a Sunday, and it was around 7. And so then I get up there, and I park on the side, and then I see uh, lights in the back, a cop. And I'm like, oh, and I had my flashers on. I'm like, oh, great. And I was thinking he probably thinks I need help, and I don't even look towards him. I mean, I saw the lights, but I don't even look back or anything. And I pace a couple times, and then um, I just jump over the side. Uh, and then I just remember waking up in Grant Hospital. Well, then I woke up later, and I was in the hospital room um, and I was hurting a lot. I woke up in pain. I was in Grant for three weeks and I had five surgeries in two days. They um, put my arms in splints. I had broke both my wrists. I broke both my ankles but the left one was shattered and I shattered my tailbone and it came detached from my pelvis. No internal injuries, no head injuries, um, but I felt this huge weight lifted off of me. I wasn't too sure about the God stuff yet, because everybody kept saying, God saved you for a reason. And I'm just like, shut up, you know? And they keep telling me, and they keep telling me. One of the nurse aides, and it was a, a man, he saw one of my recovery books, and he tried to talk to me about, he tried to tell me about Jesus, and he was telling me about him and his wife, and, you know, about Jesus, and I was like, I don't want to hear that crap, you know. And he was my nurse aide again, and then he was like, I, he's like, do you want me to brush your hair or whatever? So he started, and then, but then he washed my hair, and he, and none of the female ones did that. And now I look back, and I'm just like, he was being Jesus to me, even after I told him, I don't want to hear about that, you know. So then I, they, they sent me to a nursing home in Newark. That's how I ended up out in Licking County because of how I got hurt and my drug history. Um, and my doctor, Dr. Robertson, he came to see me three weeks in a row on Wednesday each time at like 6.30 in the morning. And then so finally on the third time he was like, you know, um, I've been going to this church and he's like, you know, it's not like, and I don't know why he said it like this, but it's what I needed to hear. You know, they're not like really super religious. 
you know, they help a lot of people in the community and do a lot of outreach. And I'm not sure of the exact date, but I remember the day. And it was church service, and I don't even remember what the message was. Wes was preaching, Pastor Humble, and... You know, at the end, he, he just did, you know, if you've never given your life to God, you know, and we pray this prayer, you know, and which is kind of sort of the same stuff that my grandfather said, you know, in this certain prayer and everything. But um, I, this time I really meant, you know, I really was like, oh, yeah. You know, I really meant it and was just feeling this connection with God, and I was just learning so much. And I could see God and Jesus just working all around me through all the people. It is sometimes hard to grasp the fact that even the worst things that happen to us can be the best things because they lead us to change our perspective, a refocusing of priorities, and sometimes a new path of life. So what is Daniel's life like today? My church family is amazing. My church is amazing. Uh, it's Newark Naz, and we do a lot of stuff out in the communities surrounding, and that's where I love, and I love the kids. So on Wednesday nights, I get to serve, and I teach third and fourth grade. There's always people there that know my whole story. Mike and Pam Roberts, they go to my church, and the first time I met Pam, I was like totally intimidated because she was getting ready to lead this Bible study with our pastor and she was dressed nice. But then when she got up there and she told her story, I was like, oh my word. And she talked about losing a daughter as a Christian and being mad at God. She talked about her time before she came to Jesus when she was always seeking and all these things. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. I could have relate a lot to it. And so we became instant friends. And then her husband is amazing and he's, like the closest thing I've, I would say like for a dad. I, I love life now. It took me a long time to say that. It took me a long time to say I was happy that I didn't die. All through my life, all through my life, all the things I've been through from childhood, the dysfunction, the abuse, um, just home life and leaving home early, all of that, I can't, all, and just all the bad things. I can't say, I wish this one would have never happened, or if this didn't happen, then this wouldn't have happened. You, I can, you can't do that, you know, because you drive yourself crazy. But if it didn't happen the way it did, ever, you know, things wouldn't have happened the way they did and ended up how they are now. You can always change. There's always hope. Um, but I also know that you know, people will never change until they're ready.